we're going to think about death. But I just briefly want to consider it as it's the basis of our title. And, and don't worry, it won't be all doom and gloom. In fact, hopefully by the end of the afternoon, we should see that there is, there is more to life and more to death than perhaps we first think. So we have that expression, didn't we, um, about returning to dust. And it's probably more familiar uh, uh, used in, in, in this set of words, isn't it? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And we think about it, obviously, when we think about uh, funerals. So, well, where does it come from, that, the particular ex expression, ashes to ashes, dust to dust? That actually dates back to 1662 and the a Book of Common Prayer, and it's the basis for the English burial service. Um, this is taken from the, uh, 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 the book of, of Room Prayer, 1662. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother here departed, we therefore commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And I could be wrong, but I still think that those words are still the words that are, that are used at, at many uh, um, burial services even today. But within that, there, is a, there are a, 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 a certain number of biblical quotes which we uh, which you'll uh, just need to uh, unpick it. So, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Well, where's this idea come from? Well, this idea of being dust, of coming from dust and returning to dust, is something that we come across in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. We read there, in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, uh, eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So that's where the idea of returning to d dust from. Now, if we consider, well, what's, what's this all about? I don't want to go into the, into the full background of, of Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 3. Um, but I suppose in summary, just to say that man was given a choice of what he could do, and he chose badly. He chose the wrong option, which is the reason why we all die. And we'll come back to the idea of, of free will and having a choice as to what we want to do uh, at the end of the talk. So this is saying about when we die, we shall return to the ground. But, well, well, where does that idea, for dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return? You think, well, we're, we're not dust, though. We're, we're, we're flesh and blood. But this, again, is referring back uh, to the previous chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we have this idea that we were made from the dust of the ground and we live and we die and we end up back in the dust of the ground. There is this sort of life cycle. Um, and actually, funnily enough, it's an idea that was sort of um, uh, born out many centuries uh, uh, after um, Genesis was written by the... Uh, by the, uh, by the inventor Sir Isaac Newton because he came up with Newton's first law of thermodynamics which is energy cannot be created or destroyed it can only be transformed from one form to another and actually if you think about it that's what happens with us we are carbon based we come from the dust and when we die we decompose and we go back to it we are part of this sort of perfect cycle so what scripture says back in, in, in the book of Genesis and, and what the scientists uh, consider today to be this idea that matter cannot be created or destroyed, they actually fit hand in hand. They are, they, are, they are exactly the same idea. Now you may think, well, that's what scientists believe, but obviously uh, Christians or people of faith will th think something completely different because they don't believe that when, that when we die we just go back to the dust, do we? And in fact, there are many Christians that, that will talk about the idea of having an immortal soul, or the idea that when we die, we go to heaven, or when we die, our, our soul goes to hell if we've, if we've, been a, if we've had a, a, led a, a, a bad life. So well, where did these ideas come from? Because one thing I can tell you for sure is they're not in the Bible. 
So what I'll just do for the next few moments is just unpick those ideas as to were these ideas of an immortal soul or the idea of going to hell or, or a supernatural devil. Just look at where those ideas have come from and then look at actually what the Bible specifically says about, uh, about what happens when we die. The thing about these ideas, the immortal soul, um, uh, heaven uh, going or hell, is that primarily they are man-made. They've all been created by man. So let's start with the idea of the immortal soul. This is a bust of Plato, who was a famous um, Greek philosopher and author. In his play, um, Phaedo, which was written about 360 BC, he wrote this line, the soul is in the very likeness of the divine and immortal and intelligible and uniform and indissoluble and unchangeable. It goes away to the pure and eternal and immortal and unchangeable to which she is kin. So this is a line of literature which Plato wrote, I say 360 BC, predates Christianity, around about the same time as Judaism, uh, but this was this is this is this is what a, a Greek philosopher wrote, and the thing is that people seem to have adopted the idea. In fact, theologians will say that this is probably where the early ideas of an immortal soul crept in. This is taken from the Greek ideas of immortality from the uh, Harvard Theological Review from 1959, and the author there, um, Werner Jaeger, said, uh, Jaeger Werner. Uh, says the, um, the immortality of man was one of the fun, f foundational creeds of the philosophical religion of Platoism that was in part adopted by the Christian church. So even theologians are saying, well, this idea came from Plato, but some of the early Christian church has actually adopted it. So what about the idea of, of an evil spirit? This idea that there is perhaps a, a, a devil, or the fact that um, there is an opposing force to uh, uh, to God and the and the force of uh, force of good. Well, again, if we look back at the history, that really predates Christianity. The idea of an evil spirit goes back to Zoroastrian times, and they, they that Zoroastrians actually are considered to be the oldest religion in the world. They predate Judaism. Um, originated in, in Persia, what would be modern day Iran or Iraq. And some people even think that perhaps the, the wise men that, that came to uh, visit Jesus could possibly have been Zoroastrians because the Zoroastrians study the stars. So that's, that, that's, that's speculation. But within Zoroastrians, they have this idea of, um, of God, Ahura Mazda. This is the highest spirit worshipped in Zoroastrians. Um, now, what they also have is they have the idea that he has an evil twin. Now, Zoroastrian scriptures are called the Gathas, but he's not actually mentioned in the Gassa. So, this twin, who's called um, Angramenu, is this evil twin of this good god, sometimes referred to as uh, Iremen if that's how you, how you pronounce it. As I say, this, this idea is, is, is there within Zoroastrian in, uh, culture, the fact that there are these, there's a good and a, and a bad uh, god. But if you just look at this um, article, which, well, this, this um, entry in a, the Encyclopedia Aranica, so about all things um, from that part of the world, uh, it says this, Araman, demon's god, adversary in the Zoroastrian religion. He seems to have been an original conception of Zoroastras, Zoroastrians in other words, and the scanty evidence in the Gathas, i.e. the Holy Scriptures, on this point may perhaps be supplemented from later sources. So again, the followers of Zoroastrians have, have created this opposing god, this bad god, this evil god, to counter the good god. It's it's a it's a man-made it's a man-made um, uh, idea. So those are the ideas about the immortal soul or, or, or going to heaven and hell. And sometimes though people will say, but no, that that the the immortal soul is mentioned in, in in scripture. It's mentioned in the Bible. 
And they go to, apart from this verse, it's quoted to try and, and, and sort of prove the existence of an immortal soul. It says, And fear, these are the words of Jesus, And fear not them which can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So sometimes people will say, but oh, look at that, that's talking about A, an immortal soul, and B, the fact that you can get that, you can go to hell. Well, actually, two points. One, it talks about this soul being able to be destroyed, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body. So therefore, if you can destroy a soul, it's not immortal. So actually that doesn't prove there's such a thing as an immortal soul. In fact, that proves that souls must be mortal because you can kill it. So th that doesn't really help the argument for an immortal soul, which, as we've said uh, prior, is an idea that came from Plato. But what about this idea, rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell? And again, sometimes people will latch on to this word and say, look at that, that must mean that, that, we're, that we literally go to um, uh, uh, hell. The thing about here, in this particular case, um, the word for hell is uh, the word Gehenna, which is one of the, which was the, uh, the fiery rubbish tip, which is outside of Jerusalem. And when we hear about this idea of, of burning in hell, it's usually talking about referring to burning in, in Gehenna. The word most commonly translated for hell is the word Sheol. Uh, and Sheol literally translates as grave. In fact, in some, if not most, modern translations of the Bible, the word hell is replaced by the word sheol, or sometimes the word grave. So, for example, Psalm 9, verse 17, if we read from the King James Version, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget. If we read from the uh, English Standard Version, the wicked shall return to sheol, all the nations that forget God. English Standard Version, New International Version, New King James Version is more likely to use the word Sheol as against the word Hell, and the word Sheol literally translates as grave. So when we're reading here, we're reading about, often when we read about Hell, we're talking about being in the grave. Exactly the same thing happens when we look at the word Satan. This is from Strong's Concordance, hence the reason it's got a number, and this, this uh, word that you can see there in the, in the Hebrew, uh, Satan, Sorten, the meaning of the word is an opponent or an adversary. But actually when we read even the King James Version, we'll see that it's not always translated as Satan. People often think Satan must be the name of a person or, or an evil spirit. But when we look at how it's translated in different verses, we see the, 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 the sentiment is the same, but quite often the word isn't exactly the same. This is uh, from First Kings. But now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. Uh, in Numbers, and the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou spitten thine ass? These three times, behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy ways is perverse before me. And finally in Zechariah, and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Each of those times, the word that is in bold is that word Satan, or Sortan, meaning adversary. And again, if you could, you could, you could easily, if you like, changed the words to put the word adversary in there, and the, the sentence, the, the verses still make sense. So, I suppose the first thing to say, really, is that we've got to be careful not to jump to conclusions when we read the Bible, that we don't just immediately see words that we think we know what they are and draw conclusions. We need to consider them carefully. So, thinking about that, what, what can we say that we know doesn't actually sort of uh, uh, isn't true or isn't from scripture the immortal soul well as we said that's a man-made thing came from Plato everybody seems to acknowledge that it came from Plato and it was adopted by early Christians the idea of an evil spirit well that actually predates Christianity predates Judaism goes back all the way to Zoroastrianism hell is the grave literally means the grave and fiery hell is usually a reference to 
the, um, the uh, fiery uh, rubbish tip that was outside of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. Satan literally means adversary. And again, if you look at the very times that it appears, and you put the word adversary in there, it, it, it does work. And also, there is no Bible record of a person going to heaven except for Jesus. So, if we think about these ideas, we can see that really they've all come from man. They've not come from the Bible. They have all been ideas that man has concluded about what happens. The thing is, there's probably about half a dozen verses that people may go to to, to try and prove these things. To try, and, Like I said, people go to that one about the immortal soul to say, well, what about this and what about that? So why are people... Why do people choose to believe this then? Why do they... Why do they choose to believe the idea of an immortal soul and going to heaven? Well, quite simply, because it's, it's more comforting. When you lose a loved one, it's a, it's a much more comforting idea to have this idea that there's a, an immortal soul and that they're now in peace and that they're now in heaven and that they're now looking down on you. It, it makes you feel better. Equally, unfortunately, the way, because of our human nature, it's also when we think about... Uh, somebody who's, who's lived their life and, and we think got away with stuff to think that they would in some way be punished in an afterlife. And again, it kind of, it feeds our, uh, it feeds our human instincts to, uh, to want uh, punishment. And so that's why so many people have just sort of accept that that's what it is because it makes you feel better. But the fact of the matter though is that that's not the case. We know, going back to our original verse, that when we die and we are put in the grave, we go back to the dust. However, there is more to it than that. This is a very important point when we want to look at anything to do with the Bible. If the Bible has got something that it thinks is important, it will repeat it and re-repeat it and re-re-repeat it. There's nothing, it doesn't back away from constantly repeating the same thing to the point that you think, why are we reading this again? We've just been looking at the Book of Acts and in that there are four occasions where we have virtually identical speeches from three different people and in one book and you think, why, is, why do we keep reading that? This is just repeating what we read a few chapters previously because it's important. So when we're trying to unpick the Bible, when we're trying to look for the Bible message, the simple rule of thumb is look for what it keeps on repeating. Look for what it keeps on saying. The Bible repeats and repeats and repeats. So let's just go back to the, the common book of prayer. Because again, within that, within that uh, um, uh, set of words which is often used at, f at funerals earth to earth ashes to ashes dust to dust yes so we know, we know where that comes from but look what it goes on to say in sure and certain hope of the, re of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ resurrection well that's not come up anywhere else yet has it certainly within uh, sort of the, ma the man made ideas of what happens after death there's no mention of resurrection, but lo and behold, here in the middle of the, uh, of the, of the book of Room for it, uh, it says that in the sure and certain hope of eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about resurrection over 40 times in the New Testament. So when I was saying repeat, 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 resurrection is the thing that comes through all the time. That's what the Bible wants us to look at. It wants us to look at this idea of the resurrection of the dead. Now, it's quite suitable actually that we're doing this talk today because, again, the majority of the world, or the Christian world, will be is celebrating Easter, the day when Jesus rose from the dead, the first to be resurrected. Now, like many things we've already looked at, the actual date of Easter is a slight uh, um, uh, sort of construct we know when Jesus died he died at Passover he was that Passover lamb and there's a brief explanation of, of how Passover is calculated 
and this year Passover uh, falls between the 30th of March and the 7th of April. So we are currently in Passover. So one thing that we do know for definite is that we're, this is the time of year when Jesus would have been crucified and when Jesus would have been raised from the dead. At the bottom there it explains how we get Easter Day and the two sort of coincide because they are, they are both down to, based around uh, l the lunar calendar. But really it's not the date that's important. What's important is what happened. We read it in our instruction reading, didn't we, in Mark chapter 16. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. This is Jesus who was in the tomb. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said amongst themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? For when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. So we see that this idea of resurrection, the first resurrection, was our Lord Jesus Christ. But it, it's more than that. It wasn't just Jesus that was raised from the dead. Or it wasn't just Jesus that shall be raised from the dead. If we go to the book of Acts, and this is actually in one of those um, uh, speeches which I said seems to keep repeating itself. We seem to have the same idea repeated three or four times throughout the book of Acts. But this is because it's important. We see Peter in Jeru Jerusalem. And this is just a, a small uh, summary of, of part of these, uh, of part of Acts chapter uh, 21, verse 24. Peter said, It shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And what Peter's doing here is he is repeating. As I say, later on, in this, in this, this, these, these words are repeated throughout the book of Acts. What Peter is actually doing is repeating what Jesus had said. If we go back to John chapter 10, and here we can see what the, the words that Jesus uh, said. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them them out of his hand. My Father which gave me them is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So Jesus was telling us here that yes, there is the possibility of eternal life, but it's not the way perhaps many others conceive, consider it. It's not an immortal soul that goes to heaven. It's talking about a resurrection and it's talking about a kingdom of, uh, uh, of um, here on the earth and that keeps repeating itself over and over again resurrection 40 times in the new testament baptism 51 times in the new testament salvation the idea that we can be saved 158 times in the new testament so if we want to look at what the bible message is then i think we can you know we can't really go far wrong by looking at these, these, these ideas, these ideas of salvation, baptism, and ultimately resurrection. That is where the Bible seems to be pointing our focus, pointing our attention. We read this in our opening introductory reading as well, didn't we? Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. The words of Jesus again. Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to every creature, that uh, he that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth, and, uh, that believeth not shall be damned. And in this case, by being damned, it means that they shall die. That when they go to the grave, that is all there is to it. It's interesting, I, had a, I, I used to work with somebody and they, he once said to me, I don't believe in God and I believe that when I die, that's it, I'm dead. 
And I said to him, I said, well, I disagree with you on the first point, because I, I do believe in God, but you're absolutely right on the second point. And he was slightly taken aback, because he said, well, well you know, because I, I think he thought I was going to say, oh, no, no, you're... And I said, no, you're absolutely right. Because you don't believe, and because you're not doing anything, then, that, 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 then you're, ab you're absolutely right. You know, you, you've kind of sussed it out for yourself. As I say, we just disagree about the existence of a God. But the Bible is very, very clear about this. And as I said at the beginning, when there's this idea of, of uh, free will, and we do quite simply have a choice. And we can choose whichever one we want to. We can follow Jesus. We can, as we've just read, go look at uh, uh, changing our ways, being baptised, and then we have that hope of eternal life when we will be raised from the dead we won't go somewhere else, but when Jesus returns, we will be raised from the dead in exactly the way that he was raised, exactly the way millions of Christians all over the world today are remembering. He was raised from the dead, and we can be raised from the dead. So that is one option. The other option is that we do nothing. Now, if we do nothing, that's fine if you don't want to if you don't want to follow uh, Jesus if you don't want to, to be part of this then that's that's your free will all I would say though is well make the most of this life because it's the only one you're going to get and literally when you're dying you're dead you're dead so that's what the Bible says it's quite a simple straightforward uh, choice you can either follow Jesus and you can have that hope of resurrection or you can just go your own way but as I say if that's the choice that you make make the most of it because this is the only life that you will lead thank you